good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Rhodes, and I'm going to be talking about research and development tax credits. In my eight years of public accounting, I find that R&D tax credits is one of the more interesting but often underutilized aspects of tax. So the purpose of this presentation is I'm going to provide kind of a high-level overview of the R&D tax credit, explain how it works, and also uh, tell you about why it's important. So this is the agenda that we're going to be covering. Um, I'll give a little bit of background about the R&D credit, um, how it came about. I'll talk about uh, Section 41 and Section 174, which is a tax credit versus a tax deduction. There's an important distinction there. Uh, in regards to how the credit works, I'll go over what we call the four-part test and go over what qualifies for R&D. And then I'll kind of tie everything together um, at, the, at the end. So the, the research credit came about in the early 1980s. Um, back in 1981, there was a, a huge recession, only second to the Great Depression of the 1930s. So in reaction to that, Congress came in and said, hey, you know, we need to do something about this. So they wanted people to get out and start spending money. So what they did was they came up with the Economic Recovery Act, and within that came about IRC Section 41, which can be found on IRS.gov under the Internal Revenue Code of 1986. So the idea was, you know, let's give a tax credit to these companies who are innovating new products, who are out there uh, developing new products and processes to get people out of their homes to start spending money to get the economy moving again. Um, in, in, addition, in addition to that was another important factor at that time was a lot of companies began outsourcing a lot of intellectual property outside of the U.S. So one of the goals was to keep that intellectual property here in the U.S. as opposed to um, sending it to countries that may not be necessarily friendly to our interests. You know, if you think about it, that could be especially important in the defense industries. So Section 41 and Section 174, you can think of Section 41 as the little brother of Section 174. Um, Section 174 can also be found on IRS.gov under the Internal Revenue Code of 1986. Big distinction between them, 174, tax deduction, 141, uh, tax credit. Now, 174 is a lot more encompassing than, than Section 41. You can pick up a lot more qualified expenditures in 174 than you can in, in Section 41. Like capitalized expenditures, you know, for example, like if you're a big research firm and you buy a scanning electronic uh, microscope, you know, this might be tens of millions of dollars. Well, you capitalize that over a number of years. Well, you can do that under Section 174. That's you cannot touch that under Section 1, uh, under Section 41. However, uh, in my eight years in public accounting. I have never seen a 174 study. Everyone does Section 41. And this is the reason why. Uh, I put together two examples here showing the, the distinction between tax deduction and tax credit. All things being equal, if you have a $20 tax credit, a $20 uh, tax deduction, look at the bottom line, the effective tax rate for the tax deduction, 28% versus 15% for the tax credit. You know, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. And if you're ever interested in finding out more information, you know, to dig into a little bit more detail about tax credits and tax deduction, there's a really good article on Kiplinger.com by uh, Kimberly Underhill that was written back in 2007. Go to the website, just enter deduction versus tax credit, easy to find. So in order to qualify for a tax credit under Section 41, you have to meet what is called the, the four-part test. If you do this, you're, you're performing R&D. The first part is the permitted purpose. The activity has to be related to something new or an improved product or process. Second part, it has to be technological in nature. This means that it has to rely on the hard sciences. This is your biology, your, your physics, uh, computer engineering, etc. 
third and fourth part is the kind of the meat of the R&D tax credit. Uh, number, number three is the elimination of the uncertainty. There has to be an unknown. You cannot know the outcome from the start of uh, developing a new product if it's going to work. You know, for example, if you're building a, a rocket and you wanted to send it, your goal is to send it to outer space, you cannot know whether or not it's going to work. Otherwise, you're just building a rocket. You know, there has to be that unknown. Process of experimentation. Process of experimentation is that iterative process that you go through, like, okay, well, I have my rocket, let me try this engine. Does it make it up to outer space? No. Okay, let me try another engine. You know, that's the iterative process. Um, what qualifies what, for, for R&D? So these expenditures, like if you're building this rocket engine, you know, what can I claim for credit? You can claim the the time and expense that you put into building that rocket. That includes all the employees that you had working on it, uh, and all of the supplies and materials that you sunk into that rocket as well. And to a lesser degree, to a lesser degree, contract research, if you pay someone to do your research for you um, outside of your company, that can qualify too. It's at a reduced rate though. So to kind of tie everything together, you know, the value of Section 41 comes in because it encourages businesses to keep that innovation moving forward. You know, this is why we see new iPods, uh, iPads, uh, the Apple Watch on a semi-regular basis. Uh, it stimulates economic growth through innovation, like I said, and also importantly, it keeps intellectual property here in the U.S as opposed to outsourcing some of that to countries that may not be necessarily friendly to, to our interests. And then finally, I'm including the research authority in case anyone wanted to look up the, the material that I researched. Questions? <laughs>